I don't know how many of you recognize the tune that John was playing during the offertory. Jesus, I thy cross have taken. Jesus, I thy cross have taken, all to leave and follow thee. Destitute, despised, forsaken. Thou, my all in all, shall be. Perish every fond ambition. All I've thought or hoped or known. Yet, how rich is my condition. All in Christ is still my own. Jesus, I thy cross have taken. All to leave and follow thee. Destitute, despised, forsaken. Thou, my all in all, shall be. Perish every fond ambition. The question that sort of hangs in the air this morning is, why in the world would you want to do that? Why in the world would you sing joyfully, Jesus, I, my cross have taken? Lord, we ask this morning that you would answer that question, that by your Spirit on this Pentecost Sunday, you would breathe life into your word, that you would speak, that you would breathe life into us, and so that we would be able to sing that song with joy. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been talking about rising above circumstances. We've been going through the book of Philippians, and here we are this morning in chapter 3. And the title of the series is a little bit paradoxical or ironic this morning. Because what we're going to discover is that we rise above circumstances, not by rising above them in the way that we understand that. We rise above circumstances, quote unquote, by going through them, and even more so by going under them. The way of the Christian life is the way of the cross, and it's the way of descent. If you take the book of Philippians and shake it, you'll always kind of have everything rattle down to the passage in chapter 2 where it says, Jesus, who was God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to be clung to, but he made himself nothing. He took on the form of a servant, became a human being, and being found in human form, he humbled himself further by suffering death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow, every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory and praise of God. If you take the book of Philippians and shake it, that's where you get back to every time. The way of descent. Scripture this morning is Philippians chapter 3, 10 through 16. The Apostle Paul from prison writes this, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us, then, who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. You're going to agree with me eventually. <clears throat> Only let us live up to what we've already attained. Again, Lord, bless this reading of your word to our hearts. Amen. Paul says, 
I press on, I strive, I, I work up a sweat, I push myself to do one thing. This one thing I do, I press on, I strive. This one thing. How are y'all at doing one thing? Because I'm bad at it. I can think to myself, I'm going to go in the other room and I'm going to get a drink of water. And I go in the other room and by the time I get in the other room, I've done seven other things and I have no idea why I went in the other room. <laughs> the idea of one, doing one thing is hilarious. If I sit down to watch television, I am watching several channels at once and I'm doing a crossword, and then maybe I'll move my phone and do a Sudoku, and then really what I'm doing is doing all those things and taking a nap at the same time. One thing, just do one thing. It's incredibly hard. And I think in Orange County these days, doing one thing is especially hard. We get up in the morning and we do whatever we have to do to be healthy, eat enough fiber, and then we go and are busy at school or work, and that means doing a whole bunch of things all at the same time, and then we get off work, and all of a sudden we have to be chefs and cooks and chauffeurs, and who knows what else, so that we can then go to whatever there is to do in the evening, whether it's sports or clubs or more stuff, and then you get home and you think, I didn't exercise yet today, so I better do that, but usually I don't because I sit down, watch television, and this thing all over again. Repeat. Sometimes uh, I've said, Steve has said, we act like functional atheists. You know, we, we come to church and we affirm our belief in God and then we leave and don't. I, I think that for us, maybe it's truer to say that we are functional polytheists. When we're here, we're all in. We absolutely entrust ourselves to God until we leave. And then we entrust ourselves to the next thing. Making enough money, taking care of the family, all kinds of very good things that we successively lay ourselves upon those altars. One thing, just do one thing. The doing of one thing is hard enough. The one thing that we're talking about here is doing the one thing of knowing Christ. Paul says, I want to know Christ, and that's the one thing I do. I press on, I strive, I work up a sweat, I leave everything else behind, I press forward to this, to know Christ. Which I'm all for. Hopefully that's what we're all here all for. When we worship, that's literally what we're doing. We're, we're bending our knees, we're bowing our hearts, and we're saying, Lord, I am all yours, entirely yours. I want to know you thoroughly, completely, and entirely. I know that's what I'm made for. I want to do this one thing. I want to know Christ. It's all through the Gospels, right? The kingdom of God is like discovering a pearl of great price, and you sell everything you have so you can get that one thing. It's like discovering a treasure in a field. You sell everything you have so you can get that one thing. Seek first God's kingdom, and everything else will be taken care of. Love the Lord your God with all your soul, heart, mind, and strength. Do this one thing. I want to know Christ. I want to be God's person. I want to be the person God created me to be. Mostly, until I read this passage and, and read the whole thing. I want to know Christ. Yes, I do. And the power of his resurrection. Amen? Thank you very much. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and participate in his suffering. Less so. I want to know Christ and the power of res his, his resurrection, absolutely. Participate in his suffering, not so much. Becoming like him in his death. I run out of momentum right about there. Whatever enthusiasm I had for doing this one thing wholeheartedly, 
I want to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, participate in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. I'll speak for myself, and I think not just for myself. I want to know the Jesus that I have invented. I want to know Christ as I define him. That is, I want to know, if you've seen a Notre Dame football game at Notre Dame Stadium, they have touchdown Jesus up on a building. I want to worship touchdown Jesus. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, and I want him to help me win. I want him to help me do what Americans do. That is, get better, stronger, faster, more. That's the Jesus I would like to empower my life. And I invented him. That Jesus doesn't exist. The Jesus who is real and alive, who is God, the second person of the Trinity, is the Jesus described in Philippians chapter 2, who chose and chooses the way of descent, who became exalted by giving himself away and becoming nothing. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, If you try to have Christianity without the cross and without participating in the suffering of Jesus in the world, if you try to have a Christianity without the cross and a suffering Christ and participating in his suffering, then you have a Christianity without Christ. I want to know Christ absolutely, which means to know Jesus as he is, the power of his resurrection, participating in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, so that I may somehow attain to the resurrection of the dead. Grace offers us Jesus and all of Jesus. Here is the life that you were created to live, to be like Jesus, to be a person who loves like Jesus. You are saved from the life you would have had if you don't enter into the life of God, and you are saved for living the life of God, which is the life of surrender and sacrificial love. That's what Paul's saying he wants. I want to know Jesus as he is. I want to know the risen, exalted Christ as he is, which means living, embodying Jesus. What an astounding, sobering challenge. N.T. Wright says this. We need Christians who will do for the world what Jesus was doing. The church must be prepared to act symbolically like Jesus to show that there is a different way of living. The church must be prepared to be the agent of healing even for those who are the lepers of modern society. Taking up the cross is not merely a passive operation. It comes about as the church attempts in the power of the Spirit to be for the world what Jesus was for the world. Announcing the kingdom, healing the wounds of the world, challenging the power structures that keep anger and pain in circulation. I dare say, and I'm certainly not the first one to say it, that when Constantine made Christianity the official religion of Rome, it was a tragic day for the church. Because when culture said following Jesus means winning, we lost the Jesus of Philippians chapter 2. And we've been confused ever since. 
The cross of Christ is foolishness. But it's the wisdom of God. It sounds foolish to me too. Why in the world would anybody want to do this? I remember I was probably six or seven years old. We came to San Clemente on vacation to go to the beach. And I was a good swimmer, but I was a good swimmer in a swimming pool. Which, you know, is not the same thing as being a good swimmer in the ocean, right? And I was, you know, more svelte then than I am now. There was less of me. And so when I went out in the waves, I was like a piece of driftwood. They would hit me, and I, I was a good swimmer, but I was terrified. And my father said, Charlie, the way you do this is when the wave comes, don't dive too deep, or, you know, you'll hit your head and that'll be bad, but dive under the wave when it's coming. And, it's, and I looked at him like he was crazy. It can't possibly work. What a bad idea. One of the times my dad was right. <laughs> Here comes this enormous wall of water. My first instinct is to run the other way. My second instinct is to go over it. My last instinct is to go under it. To follow Jesus by participating in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, means that we have to take our survival instincts and not follow them. Why in the world would you do that? Paul's answer is this. I press on. I want to know Christ because Christ Jesus has made me his own. And if you haven't had the factual experience of knowing that Jesus has thrown his arms around you and loved you and claimed you and said, you are mine and nobody's taking you away from me no matter what. If you haven't known that and rested in that and embraced being embraced, then this really is foolishness. To the extent that you know you're loved, you can follow Jesus anywhere. To the extent that you don't know, and this just sounds like masochistic obligation, then it is masochistic obligation. We follow Jesus because we want life, not because we want death. We're not crazy. Life comes from following Jesus down even into suffering and death. And that's where life comes from. That's the principle the universe operates on. I press on to make this one thing my own because Jesus has made me his own. Brianne's going to sing one of my very favorite hymns, Love That Will Not Let Me Go. I rest my weary soul in thee, says the first line. And the last verse is on the screen. O cross that liftest up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay in dust life's glory, dead, and from the ground there blossoms red life that shall endless be. This is a hard word, but it's, it's the fact of who Jesus is. It's the principle the universe operates on. It's what the Christian life is. I'm glad it's Pentecost because God needs to breathe life into this and into us. Let's take a second and pray that he would. Lord, we ask that you would indeed Help us know where the good news is in this. Help us know the life that's in what you offer us. Help us know that you call us to joy. 
Help us know that you call us to not masochism, but rich, abundant life. This is a mystery. And we surrender ourselves to you and ask that you would help us make sense of it, even as we follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Trace the rainbow 